Hello everybody and welcome to my review of volume number 5 of Kugane Maruyama's light novel series, Overlord. This one subtitled The Men of the City. It's part one of two, so the story does kind of end on a bit of a cliffhanger leading into part two, which will be covered in volume number six. This one put out in English by Yen On. I've of course reviewed all of this series to date, and it is definitely one of my favorites. And as far as I'm concerned, volume number five does not disappoint. Um, although I do know, or at least I think, that some of you may be slightly disappointed by this volume, and we'll get into that. So, one of the main things about this book that may or may not appeal to you as a fan of Overlord is that Eins is almost entirely absent from the book. He is in a very, very small part of the one chapter, and other than that, it's more just his presence or or his name being mentioned by his servants from Nazareth that are mentioned along the way. He's really not in the book at all. Like, he doesn't really exist as a physical presence. And so if you love Eins and you love seeing him whip out incredible powers to destroy enemies, or even as the sort of dark, dark warrior Momon, and I think that's where some of you may become a bit disappointed with this volume, just by the fact that in volumes 1 through 4, we've had some pretty big battles. We've had some very, very strong opponents. I mean, let's face it, the whole throwdown between Eins and Shaltir, and even, like, the battle between, like, the undead dragon or whatever, and everything, you know, like, there have been in every volume some really big battles that have required Eins to use some powerful magic and to push his abilities at least a little bit. I still don't think we've seen him go completely all out, but, uh, you know, there have been some really big battles. That really doesn't happen in this one. Instead, this book is really about world building and dealing with politics, dealing with a lot more about corruption. It focuses far more on Sebas, who is the butler of Nazarick, and he's an interesting character. In fact, I would say of all the denizens of Nazareth, the tomb of Nazareth at this point, aside from Eins himself, I found that I was really invested in Sebus because for me, he was an interesting character in that he was created by the sort of character that event that created this whole guild that Eins was a part of. Um, and the whole idea is, is that his creator still had compassion. That the whole reason that they brought all of these freaks together that were being picked on and everything else by all of these other players was because they still felt that everybody should have a hand up. That everybody should be supported regardless of how they've chosen to play the game, whether they're monsters or not. And so some of that compassion has been sort of instilled in Sebus. It's part of his DNA, part of his very creation. And we see that playing out in this volume, much to his own emotional distraught. And that he's, he fully comprehends that he needs to be completely loyal to Eins because he is the only remaining of the 41 supreme beings. He knows that he doesn't want to do anything that is going to jeopardize Nazarick or all of its denizens. He knows that he has a mission that he is supposed to be performing. And yet, because there is this part of him that has been programmed, I mean, essentially programmed, to have compassion and to help those who are downtrodden, he gets involved in a whole bunch of situations that really seem to be quite contrary to his mission. And seeing his conflict, seeing how he starts to resolve that conflict in his own mind, I thought was really entertaining. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've liked about the series is the thing with Eins, his mental conflict over this whole concept of, I used to be just some salary man who was working for numerous bosses and everything else, and now suddenly... I have these people looking up to me who are worshipping me and I have to take on this role of a leader and seeing his self-doubt and seeing his internal conflicts, 
have made him a very interesting character to me and a fun character to read. And seeing this now in Sebus and almost the inverse of that problem, which is he is incredibly powerful, well-respected. He knows his place, but at the same time, he knows that there is a part of his personality, of his programming, that is somewhat contrary to everybody else in Nazareth. And to see that conflict and to see him going along in this book, I really liked him. I, I really liked him as a character. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping we see more of him as a character. Well, obviously, I'm thinking we will, because, I mean, part one of two. But each one of these books has sort of not only featured Ainz, but has sort of shifted the view towards other characters from Nazareth as well. Um, and for me, it's really exciting because reading this volume, I found that I was really into it. Uh, Overlord is one of those books, one of the series that I would say really takes that whole swept away to a fantasy world kind of thing and really makes it feel like it's a high fantasy type series. Like it totally could work without the game mechanic thing. As I said, the the whole setup of it, of course, it influences everything. The whole idea that Nazarick came from another place, they're uncertain about this world, the doubts that Ainz has because of who he truly was before he became Ainz Augul. I mean, all of these things make the series really interesting and drive a lot of the narrative to it. But it's one of the few series to me that it just still feels like a really good high fantasy type series where there is a lot going on in this world. In fact, we fe feature, I would say probably more so than any of the other books, human characters and, and human characters apart, like not just that they're hanging out with uh, people from Nazareth, but that they are it very much like the lizard men, I guess in, in volume number four and the one before this, where a lot of the story focused on the lizard men characters. And this one, we're focusing on human characters. We're focusing on Klein, who is the sort of chosen protector of the princess. We're focusing on Brian Unglas, who, if you recall, was the lead sort of, you know, ultimate warrior for the thieves who were destroyed by Shaltier and seeing his sort of what's become of him after he ran away from that battle with Shaltier, seeing what's become of him and, and how that's shaken him to his foundations and seeing how this broken man is starting to, because of what happens in this book, starts to find a new reason to stand strong again. Like this book is, is so filled, this volume is so filled with world building and these characters who all are driven by demons. We have Clime who is driven by this idea that he is weak and inferior and because of this incredible woman that he serves who saved him that he's in love with, he feels he must become stronger and he's hounded by his weakness and his feelings of inadequacy. We have Brian who's been up until, you know, he faced Shaltier, thought that he was ultimately confident in his strength and his power and his ability to overcome, who is now broken because that strength was proven to be meaningless in the face of Shaltier. And then we have Sebus, who is, meanwhile, very confident in many of his abilities, but at the same time is filled with these conflicting emotions and ideas of who he should be and what is best to do in terms of what is best for Nazareth and yet still can be agreeable to his own ideas and morals. It's so cool to me just to see a light novel that can work in sort of different arenas and take different characters that are, are broken and everything else in different ways and through all of the sort of a twist of events, bring them all together into sort of this idea that starts to fix them or starts to have them kind of developing this idea of how they can become stronger and better. And of course, the, the ongoing themes of characters who aren't what they always seem, uh, that particularly plays out in some character that I won't tell you about. You'll have to wait till you get to the end of the book to sort of get an idea there. But 
it's just, it's very, very cool to me, this series. It's well written. Um, I mean, it is written, I would say, on par with any other high fantasy series that I've read in the past. Uh, it is certainly heads and tails above, you know, just a, a sort of by the numbers type uh, isekai or swept away to a video game world type series. It is filled with some very heavy themes. I mean, human trafficking, slavery, and everything else comes into play here. Um, it it's a it's a much more mature type story. Uh, certainly, the the levels of violence, uh, the the levels of being open about what's going on. Like, I mean, there's there's a brothel. There is this very seedy side to the city that it doesn't shy away from. It's a very much more adult and dark series, which I really appreciate. And I think that's probably why it gets away with having these characters who are so multidimensional and multifaceted and broken and everything else, because it just, it's creating this world where they work, right? Because the world itself is broken and multifaceted and there's all these different masks and society trying to put forward certain way that isn't true and yeah, I mean, for me, this volume, um, again, for those of you that love, like, this series when it's all about some incredible battles, this will probably seem like a much slower volume. It will probably seem like a little bit dragged out and dry. But to me, for somebody who, I mean, as much as I love a great battle scene, um, <laughs> I do, but to have a series that, is creating this really in-depth world that felt kind of lived in and that has all this different potential and seeing how these outsiders from Nazareth are getting pulled into it and getting involved in it and what that might mean for them down the road. It's really exciting to me. Like it just, like the, the prospects for this series and where it can go from here, like there's just so many different threads going on and different ways that this story can play out. I'm just really, really excited about this one. If you can't tell, uh, I really enjoyed this volume. It kept me hooked right through. Uh, and as I said, it, it made me really, really invested in Sebus particularly, but even Solution, like we get a bit more of her character, which is interesting. And, and yeah, I mean, I am really, really excited to see where volume number six is going to take us and, and beyond. I mean, this series, it just, every volume to me is just as good, if not better than the one that came before it. And that's pretty exciting when you're already on volume five and you still feel that way. So those are my thoughts on volume number five of Overlord. You know, for some of you, it might not be the greatest of the volumes, but if you're looking for world building and some really cool characters that have a lot of room for growth, this is definitely a fantastic volume. So for my next review, I'm going to be reading something completely different, and that is going to be Anime Supremacy from uh, Vertical Inc. is putting this one out in English. As far as I know, it's just a one-shot novel, but sounds really cool. It's about a couple of women working in the anime industry, and in particular, this one season where they are trying to put their own anime up against a veteran animator's uh, work to try and, you know, be profitable and... Yeah, it just, it sounds really, really cool to me. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to giving this one a read, and uh, I'll let you know what I think in the next video. So if you're brand new here and you love light novels, you should consider subscribing. I do two to three reviews every single week, as well as a weekly countdown of the top 10 best-selling light novels in Japan. Thank you very much for joining me in this video, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Till then, bye-bye for now.